Okay. All right. So that was a great first uh, introduction about how Docker machine helps you provision a machine, uh, either locally or uh, remotely. Um, and then uh, there was mention about Docker for Mac. So Docker for Mac was, um, I think, it's currently in production ready, um, kind of production ready. So. That's kind of as he as he mentioned as sorry Sergey yeah. as Sergey mentioned, um, Docker for Mac kind of um, hides the complexity of the virtual machine that's running. Uh, it allows you to run uh, when you do a Docker compose up and you expose a port instead of having to find out where the virtual machine is, what's the IP. Docker machine uh, sorry Docker Swarm actually opens uh, a proxy service on your laptop that then proxies the request directly to the virtual machine. So it looks like it's running locally. Uh, but it's not like I have. Um, let's just quickly uh, Docker. Is that readable? Is that readable there as well, or need to be bigger? A little bit bigger. Yeah. Okay. So Docker uh, info. This is actually actually doc Docker version. I'm using Docker for Mac here. And as you can see, my client is running on Darwin. Sorry, I won't run out of the camera. <laughs> and my client is on, uh, on Darwin. And then uh, my host is on Linux. So even though I am um, running as, as if it's locally, it's still actually running a Linux virtual machine. So that's kind of like a, a trick that Docker did. They hide the complexity, but it's still using virtual machines in the background. Um, and if you want to play with things such as multiple machines, you still need Docker machine. You want to create a swarm cluster, you need Docker machine. Okay. All right, so Docker for Mac is, is was very, I mean, is is very easy for developers to just get started with Docker. Although, um, so continuing in the trend, uh, Docker announced back in June uh, a, a project called Docker for AWS and Docker for Azure. So those those projects are still in beta, and uh, you need to go to beta.docker.co and you can uh, request access to the beta. So because it's because they need to control how many people have access, so they can handle the the support queries. So they are doing like phased rollout of this. Okay. Um, so yeah, in, in case I, I I assumed I was going first, so I was going to explain a bit about, about Docker, but I assume everybody knows Docker, so I'm not going to explain much about it now. Sorry. <laughs> um, so. Docker for AWS, uh, this is the part where you get access. When you request access, they require, if you do the Amazon uh, one, they require your account ID because they will give you access to some uh, Amazon machine images that you cannot access normally. So even though uh, in my screenshot I am showing you like what happens when you, when you open it, you get like this template URL. You could quickly write it down and, and try to run it, but it won't work because uh, it will say that you don't have access to the, the machines. Uh, to, to actually set up the stack. Um, so the way it works is like very similar to Docker machine where you create on the common line a machine. Um, here we are using either uh, via this common line or how do uh, or if I use if I use the um, Amazon CLI tools, I use AWS CloudFormation create stack. And then I provide the stack name, the URL, and then I provide all my parameters on the command line. So I can do it like that, or I can do it uh, using the actual um, CloudFormation um, template from, from Amazon. So it gives me options to define how many managers I want to run and how many workers. So when we talk about a cluster uh, environment, um, we will have um, some kind of like masters that will control how the, on which node the containers will run. So you will have many worker nodes that will actually run the, the containers. Okay. So there's this uh, in every single um, clustering solution that I know of: Kubernetes, Mesos. Mesos has masters as well, right? And minions. Um, every solution I know of has this concept of having managers and workers. Um, so you need to specify how many managers, and you have a choice. Maybe I can just show it. Like once you get access. You can click on the Launch Stack button and um, click on, let me make it bigger. Click on Next. And you get this um, specified details, give it a name. And you have options. 
So the options are either one master, which means that if it goes down, your cluster dies. So not good for high availability. Second option is three. Why not two? Because um, if you know like clustering or distributed uh, storage systems, they need to be um, they need to have resilience against uh, network splits. So if uh, if you have two um, nodes and one node fails, then the other node doesn't know if it's alone or, or like it, it usually cannot make up its mind. Or they're both split, then you have a, a split brain. If you have three, if you have one node fails, you still have two nodes to remain consistency in the cluster. So they use a distributed cluster, like distributed storage mechanism. And the options there for high availability are either one, three, or five. Uh, at the moment, only up to five. So five gives you then two node failure resilience. And um, for my stack, I just used one one master. And you can actually increase that, because in Amazon, it's called an uh, auto-scaling group. So you can change the auto-scaling group to, to um, later on have more resilience. And then number of nodes, those are actually the, you can go up to 1,000. It's going to take a while. It's going to cost me money. I'm not going to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, so I can create many different uh, worker nodes, and then they will uh, run the containers. And then I can specify the type of uh, machines that I want to provision for this. Um, and I can specify uh, my SSH key that I want to enable uh, for access. OK. Um, so it's very like easy. Um, you don't need to worry about how it actually works. Uh, you, give, you give the permissions. I don't know if I should clear, create the cluster now. <laughs> um, do I did I did I put that as it? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> See that's why uh, <laughs> I make I make beautiful demos. <laughs> um, it's my personal account too. So <laughs> um, there is uh, I have not played with the advanced op advanced options, but um, once you come to the point that you acknowledge that this uh, cluster will create VPCs, subnets, and all of that. Uh, and then when I click Create, it will create. But uh, let me not click Create right now. You know what? Let me run it on the, on the command line. I have. I will try to, I will post, I will try to push this, um, this, this markdown file so people can repeat what I did. So in this one, I'm, I'm setting my default profile. I have them preset on my laptop. I'm setting the region, and then I'm doing a create stack. So let me run that one out. Oops. Ah. What did I do? Uh, OK. I need. It's a bit of a mess. Yeah, that's not going to work. Um uh, sorry. I'll just paste it here. I just want to change the name. Docker AWS. Ah, yeah, I already changed the name, so I can just execute it normally. I don't know what's happening here. Uh I had okay, I had this happen before as well. Let me do read me. This is not the right meaning. OK, forget about it. I'm going to click the button. <laughs> OK, just click the button. Let's keep it simple. All right. OK, so um, right now it's creating this. So last time when I created it, the, it started at around, like I started at 3.14, and it finished at around um, 3.24. Like, then it was complete, so about 10 minutes. Uh, to complete this cluster. And I have one master and three. What's happening in the meantime? OK. So, so the first thing it, it does, it creates a, a VPC, a vir virtual private uh, cloud, and create net subnets and security groups within there, all pre-configured. Um, it creates two auto-scaling groups, one for the managers, one for the workers, uh, set with the desired capacity that you pre predefined in the template. 
Uh, then the managers, when they start to come online, they will join and form a quorum using Raft. Raft is a protocol, uh, which is what I mentioned, to have distributed uh, storage system. Um, and then after the managers have started, the workers will join the Swarm cluster. So if you do this manually, you need to create the EC2 instance. You need to provision Docker on it. You need to, um, once Docker engine is ready, you need to create the um, you know, swarm mode, enable the swarm mode, create one master. Then you get a, a token. Either you need to have either token-based or on a, on a different type of, um, you can do a token-based or based on discovery. Um, you have to join the other nodes to the, to the masters. Then you have to promote the nodes to masters if you want to have more masters. So that's very manual. And now it's all happening in the background. And by the time I stop talking, it's probably finished. Um, so then after that, whenever it creates two ELBs, one is for SSH access, and one is for any services that you create within the cluster. Um, I have not looked exactly like how to, um, like right now, the ELB, I actually manually choose the ports to expose. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a better way to do that, but um, I have not looked into that. And so then it's ready for deployment. Um, so what I wanted to show was, actually, I forgot to stop there. If I click on the Launch Tag button, and I can click here, View Edit Template in Designer. Uh, so this is the, the standard um, CloudFormation editor from Amazon. It's loading. And then it's showing me like an overview of, of what the stack looks like. So there's a whole bunch of systems that it creates. Oops, and I just dragged things around, which I didn't want to do. Um, but one of the interesting things, I, I think, in here is the, the fact that it, and I actually have the screenshot here, so let's just go here. So one of the inter interesting things that it does is it's create this uh, SQS like uh, notification or queuing system. So I read online, this is, I mean, I put inside here the link to the information, the purpose of SQS. Um, is to whenever there is um, an instance, Amazon is going to terminate an instance, there is a grace period, like there may be a notification. And SQS is actually going to react on that. So the instance can learn about if it's impending doom and then gracefully exit. And we'll see, I hope to show you the actual way of draining if you man manually want to retire an instance, how you drain the containers out of it. But uh, it can also react to uh, notifications from the Amazon cloud to, ma to do that for you automatically. Um, so there's a little link to the source where I got this from. OK, so I actually talked about Docker. Um, OK, let's continue. So I had, I had a bit of a slide here on to explain, like, um, we have a cluster of managers, and then they create a, a RAF protocol. And there's a GRCP, a GRPC, like a, a, a proto, a kind of like a binary protocol to, to do efficient communication between the workers and the managers. Um, and about the strongly consistency. And then the, the workers, actually, because if you have a cluster of 1,000 workers, for all of them to, to have a consistent view, it's, it would take a long time to propagate the information. So they are eventually consistent. That means if you are creating the networks that we talked about earlier, like uh, virtual networks where we connect the containers to, they are actually only exist on the, on the workers that are involved with those containers. And so the propagation is only contained within a certain um, uh, part of your cluster. So it's, it's trying to do everything as efficient as possible. And if you look on the Docker blog, they just posted a lot of videos from, uh, I think, beginning this month, like 8 October, there was a, a, a distributed system summit in uh, Europe, uh, which was focused on how exactly does this work. And they actually, look, they actually explain how they do the heartbeat between the manager and the worker, how they do all of that. It's very interesting, very, very good to, to, to understand. But you don't need to, because Docker for AWS does it all for you. Um, OK, I'm not going to go into too many details. I'm just going to go through the, the actual demo that I have. So part of Docker for AWS is that it's running this new Docker 1.12 engine, which has its own clustering system, basically what, what I just explained. And this was announced back in June. So in June, we had a, a meetup here as well. And I, I, I demonstrated how Docker 1.12 was doing this. And I'm kind of reusing a little bit of the, the, the same uh, meetup, uh, sorry, the same uh, visualizations, I mean, tools. OK, that's not cool. Did I just break my, my demo environment? Probably. <laughs> 
Um, let me just kill this here. Ah. So what I'm doing here, I'm 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 um, adding in the low. I'm adding a load balancer uh, TCP uh, HTTP port to port three thousand. Please work. Okay, there it is. So this is um, a a container that I deployed. So in my script, I show that I am running uh, something called the Manomarks visual Visualizer, which is like a Node.js application that talks with the Docker um, API over the Docker socket. And it allows me to show this fancy uh, graphic of how the service, uh, like this is my cluster of all the nodes, and, uh, and how whenever I create a service, how it gets uh, assigned to the nodes. So that's a cool little thing. Um, so here, yes, I, I, because I create this running on a certain container, I am actually setting up my, my load balancer to expose this port. I'm doing this manually because I'm not using the correct uh, syntax for running it as a service. I should probably do that, but I didn't have the time. Um, so next, I'm going to run simple nginx. So I actually skipped a few steps here. Uh, after I create the, the, the stack, there is inside CloudFormation, there is an output. So I can query. If you see here, I'm querying the output from the stack. And I'm getting the key, which is the default DNS target. And I'm storing that into the uh, vi uh, environment variable. So if I do echo default, so this is my ELB uh, DNS target. So I can hit that, and it will, it will hit my cluster, and then it will find the, node, the, the containers. So if I curl that right now, there is nothing there. I mean, I can't hit it. So if I execute this command to create, uh, there's another thing that I did here, which is I'm running uh, an SSH tunnel from my local machine to the, ho to the default DNS target in the background. And I'm exposing the uh, Docker socket uh, on local port three, 2374. It's in the guides when you when you run it. So if I look here, I have this job running in the background. That means that I can That means that when I set my so basically earlier when Sergey talked about Docker machine, when you Docker do, when you do Docker machine I don't have anything now, but when you do Docker machine Env, it basically gives you a whole bunch of like uh, environment variables to set, like the, t the, the TLS uh, SSL certificate and so on. Now, because I'm doing, I'm using an SSH tunnel and I'm I'm connecting to uh, like I'm I'm not using c um, certificates when I connect. I'm using an SSH tunnel, so I don't I don't have a TLS verification on my client, but I can do Docker PS and my Docker client of my laptop is talking to the the cluster. So I can see I have my uh, visualizer running there, and I have a whole bunch of controller nodes, uh, controller containers working. So I can do Docker node ls, and I can see those same nodes that I see in my visualizer here. Uh, those are the nodes inside my cluster. So that's all happened uh, last time I spin up the cluster. And okay, so now I can do. I can show the whole Docker info, but it's going to be a whole bunch of information. Um, I don't know what's, what to pick out here. Let's forget about it. Uh, so then I'm going to finally actually deploy something, which is I'm going to create a service, Nginx. Uh, and I'm telling him that I want to expose port 80. So what's happening here earlier, somebody asked, what about how do I expose the service? So I have an ELB. And if I go to the ELB, Cancel. Uh, let's close that. Anyway. OK, so I have two ELBs here. And if I look at the listeners, this is my, oh no, this is my stacks. Sorry, my ELBs are here. Load balancers. Uh, 
so now I have my original stack that I created uh, at 3 p.m. today, and then the one that I just created now. So I'm looking at this one. If I um, look at the listeners, right now I manually added port 3000, right? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to run this command. And Docker for AWS is automatically going to update my ELB with the ports that I want to expose. So if I refresh this, now port 80 is exposed. But I never told Docker uh, about my own addition, so obviously he gets rid of it. Um, so if I want to see, see my virtualizer, I need to add that again. OK, so I manually add it back to the load balancer with the command. And now my otherwise, my visualizer won't work. So my visualizer is now showing that Nginx is running on one of the nodes. So next, uh, I can open it. Like, let me do that curl command that I had before. I I, I, it's probably very confusing, <laughs> all the things. But anyway, I'm doing a curl. And now it works, right? I'm seeing Nginx is available. I can open that as well. That's going to open Safari, but OK. Where is Safari? OK, so I have Welcome to Nginx. I'm hitting it inside the cluster. Wonderful. Um, so next thing, I can look at. So basically, what I did here was I created a service, right? And the service name is Nginx. So I can call, I can say, service ls, and it's going to show me all the services that exist within my cluster. There's one, nginx. And I can, let's see what, I, I can inspect it to find out the information about this service. And I should type with an d in the front. So this is, if I specify pretty, if I don't, then it will be, um, it will be JSON. But if you do dash dash pretty, you will get a YAML output, kind of like YAML, right? And um, and so basically, it tells me that this is target port 80 and published on port 80. So this is the, this is the interesting part for me. Where is this published? On which port? OK. So I can also list all the containers that make up, or they call it tasks, all of the tasks that are um, make up this uh, service. So I have one at the moment. And I can scale it up. So I so I told Docker, please scale my service to 5. And if I do an inspect, it's going to tell me that the desired state is 5. And if I do a PS, it's going to show me that 5 are running. And if I go to my visualizer, you will see that the nodes are. Except that one is not yet. It's preparing. So everything else is running already. So the, the other manager is still pulling. And now it's running. Okay. So now we have. Um, five Nginx across all of the servers. So if one of the nodes goes down, it will still be reachable because we have a load balancer that directed traffic over port 80, so uh, via port 80. So that's all working. Uh, I can't show you because if I hit it, it's always going to return the same thing. So let's try and make it a change. So if it runs on a certain node, it's going to return something different so we can show you that it's actually load balancing. All right, so. Sorry, what happens if you over provision to go over the number of I actually haven't tried it. <laughs> it would be hard because I have one gigabytes of memory, and, and Nginx takes what like very few. Uh, I, I I would need to scale it very high. No, I mean uh, that you have two containers on the same node. Ah, oh yeah, I can scale. I can, I can scale it like let's say one hundred. <laughs> okay. So the thing is, these containers are running and connecting into an internal network. And then there's a routing mesh, uh, which is on all. I don't know why that one is not taking anything. Ah, because I said it inactive, didn't I? Um, just one second. What's this IP is? Uh, three, three, uh, sorry, 222, OK. I set it to drain, so let me put it active. Uh, on the next scaling. So um, it doesn't rebalance automatically uh, unless one of them dies. Like I, I will show you when I actually set this one for draining. Uh, then if I make this one active, I set this one for draining, you will see everything move. So we'll do that. It's fun, isn't it? Looks beautiful, isn't it? <laughs> it's not me. I didn't write any of that. It's all from the Docker people. They did a wonderful job. Um, so yeah. So I can. I can do Node.js. Yes. Ah, yeah. This is where I was draining, right? It was my next demo move. I, for, I forgot to uh, make it active again. Well, your question was, what if there are multiple, right? How so does it 
how does it handle ports? So, do I have uh, a slide of that? I don't have a slide. So basically, it's, a, it's, it's very similar to how Kubernetes works, and I'm more familiar with Kubernetes. So, uh, <laughs> so you have, when it hits the port, it actually hits uh, the port on the node. It actually redirects the packets to an internal network of all the, of all the containers. I was about to say pods. Uh, so all the containers that are running on the, on the, they're isolated, fully isolated from the external network. It's just that there's a proxy service running on every, um, on every node that is opening port 80. And I believe this uses IPVS. Uh, like there's a, it's a very interesting. So, so it's like, it's a kernel routing. It's a layer four kernel routing uh, mechanism. So it's it's basically do like a, a kind of a broadcasting uh, to find out the nodes. Uh, I think we can read more about that. Like, um, Is it an issue? The first time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. OK, so this was a presentation back in uh, DockerCon Europe 2000, uh, last year. And there was a presentation from one of Andrei Sibiryov from, uh, um, he was working at Uber, I think. And um, he was talking about this IPVS uh, kernel technology that allows you to like uh, load balance across nodes. It's like very interesting presentation. And, uh, and basically, after since, since then until June, Docker basically implemented it inside their cluster. So it's, it's, it's a very impressive route, m routing mesh across all of the nodes. Um, really cool stuff. And they open sourced all of this, like they call it, um, like they, they, they open source each part as like a VPN kit or infra kit or anything. So anything that makes up this, this thing, this um, Docker 1.12, it's all open sourced. And uh, because they like to involve the community into improving all of the thing, all of the services that they develop. Okay, so if I keep talking like this, I'm going to take two hours. <laughs> um, so next part, I'm going to do this this draining of a of a node. So I can do a list here, and um, I'm going to select one node. Let's say two four seven, and I'm going to do the drain. And replace that. Can you drain with ID? Uh, maybe. I haven't tried. Don't mess up my my demo, <laughs> man. <laughs> I'm not gonna try it right now. Oh, let's go to the visualizer. <laughs> okay, so it's draining that one node that I selected, totally randomly selected, <laughs> and um, and so now that m that node is available for you know, maintenance. And I can um, set up another one. I can reactivate it. You can try out the ID droning. <laughs> and um, so it doesn't automatically rebalance here, right? But if I drain another node, let's say I pick up 223. So pick up, OK, let me try it. So the. Oops, what did I do? Oh, no, I just broke my terminal. Oh, that's going to be a pain. Um, yeah, it works. Huh? Yeah, so he's draining and he's putting them back on that node. All right, so and it goes quite fast, actually. Um, OK, so then the n we did the update. Uh, we set it to drain and then back to active. And then the next thing is, what if we want to disable, like we want to replace one of the managers? Then there will be a process of, of uh, if I if I um, if I choose the leader. So if I do uh, Docker node ls. <sighs> okay, so right now if I would tell him to drain the leader here, then these other two managers will have to do a leader election. I uh, haven't tested it. I'm not going to demo it, <laughs> uh, but. If you want to try it out, I've put in a link. There's reference. If you, I'm going to push this. I'm going to share it on the Meetup group. 
If you go there, you will see this this draining part that I showed you, and you uh, you will be able to see how to like do leader election and all of that, how that works. Um, so then the next thing I wanted to do was um, to actually show the load balancing. So I'm going to create a service called uh, City. Uh, this is not my example. It's um, I I think I put the reference here as well. Um, so there's like oh no. I, I will add the reference, but um, I rebuilt it because I, I, I did a bit of a change. Anyway, so OK, let me do this. Like Docker service create, I'm giving it the name city. I said I want five. Maybe I should uh, remove the Nginx before I do that. Or I will be over <laughs> over <laughs> overloading the cluster. Uh, RM, Nginx, bomb, done. So they're all being deleted. OK, bye bye. And um, create, oh, I didn't. All right, so in this case, I, I built a, a, a small, I mean, not I didn't build. I, I cloned this, um, this JSON application, which basically, um, this is version 2, where it says, really suggest to visit and then a certain city. So it randomly picks a city. It shows the host name, and it shows a city that was, um, that was chosen. So it kind of shows us which, which one of the nodes is, uh, which one of the containers is, is serving us. Um, so let's, I expose the port, but my, my visual, like right now, this one is broken. Right, because I, I created, I asked Docker for AWS expose port. Um, I don't remember which port, and automatically it removed my own manual added thing. So I need to add that again. Okay, and it will take a while, but there it is. And the five instances of the random city are running. So now I'm going to show that if I hit uh, the port that I exposed, so I expose port eighty eighty one. So I'm going to um, use this command to to hit it. Let's put it up here, if I want, if I can go up here. OK, so now it's, it's hitting. And it's, because it's version 1.0, it shows me the host name and suggests to visit. Blah. It's an interesting thing. Every time you see there's a, not every time, but there's a load balancing going on. It's different containers getting hit. Uh, I can confirm the containers by doing uh, docker service ps city. That's my, my name. So I have, um, like, 31901, that's, um, where is that host? I don't see it. Somewhere. <laughs> What's going on? Eh? For sure, it's hitting one of the containers. <laughs> this one, the first one here. I don't know if you can read that. Let me try and make it bigger. So the 319, is it readable? That's the one that's, that was getting hit. And then the, basically, it's the name of the container. So that one should be in there, though. If I do PS, I should see it somewhere. I don't know why I don't see it. Anyway, uh, let's ignore that. <laughs> and um, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to do the famous rolling update that every cluster uh, presentation has to do. Uh, so I'm going to tell Docker service to update the image to version 1.1. And as I already uh, indicated, if I if you see that in, in version 1.1, it's uh, improved. It says really suggests. It's a little bit more insistent. So if I, um, I do update and I put in version 1.1, then you see, um, no, you don't see anything. <laughs> Visualizer, maybe. Containers are being replaced, right? There's a 1.1 running. There's another one being replaced. And as they are being replaced, the load balancer should start hitting the new versions. Actually, is it a round robin or is this load base? Kind of oh, there we go. Yeah, I don't know exactly the, the, the exact load balancing uh, mechanism. But there's a few version 1.0 still. But in the meantime, there's a 1.1 there as well. So rolling update worked. Yeah, cool. And here, actually, we still have uh, one. 1.0 running, and we should see the 1.1 pick up. And 1.1, it's replaced. So now we should not be getting any of the 1.0 anymore. Don't ask me how to stop uh, a rolling update. 
Well, we still see one. Don't ask me how to stop it. Don't ask me how to do a rollback. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think if you want to do a rollback, it's very declarative. Oh, something went wrong. I want to go back to 1.0. You just specify image version 1.0. And, uh, and obviously, it starts rolling. You do another rolling update. OK, so that's one thing. Um, oh, yeah, when I do this, you actually see that there is an update in progress here in the, in the message. Uh, I haven't played more with it right now, so that's, that's all I have for the demo. I mean, that's a no, that's part two. I have a part three as well. Uh, and that's the example voting app. So the app that he just showed sh running on one machine, how can we deploy it on this cluster? So it runs across all of the nodes. Um, so I also did the same thing. I cloned it. I can show you um, when it runs locally. So I'm going to. Sorry, a lot of things that I should have closed. OK, here. Okay, so if I do Docker compose up, so I get the same as a uh, presentation earlier. It's starting all of the containers, showing me the logs. Um, I didn't do the demonization, so it's or det I didn't detach it. But the point is, yes, I can run it locally. And I have the same. Situation: I I press cats, it updates. I go back. I press dogs, and it updates to dogs. Works. All right. So that's running locally. Wonderful. So let's close it. Yeah, that's not good. Docker compose down. It's going to remove everything. Done. Uh, let's say I'm happy with this. So the next step is I want to deploy. So when it like when you work with uh, with containers you do you use dockerfy you build an image and then you push the image and and you deploy it so uh, with with uh, bundles you have a compose file and you need to build something called a distributed application bundle so to do that um, okay i can do a docker so the first thing the the original voting application i had to make some changes i am um, in the docker compose and i had help from an uh, Marcos Niels, one of the Docker captains, another one. And um, so I basically added an image tag. So before the, in the original one, it's not. So I added that. But I'll, uh, I, I detailed the changes to make it work. It's actually, I have to, I have to say one thing, though. This is still uh, very, I, I, it's still experimental. So there's still some things that are not working 100%. So like one of the things I had to do was I had to edit the, the compose file. Then I can do Docker compose build and because I built it before it's go very fast because uh, it's re using the cache as you see everything is using cache 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 so now if I do docker compose bundle so that's going to create a bundle file and I can specify push and it's going to okay so it actually just uh, did a don it, it did a bundle and then it also pushes the images but because I didn't change anything he didn't push it again apparently isn't it <laughs> uh, let me check that I don't know why you didn't push. Yeah, it is Docker, Docker Compose Bundle Push. So if you do this option, it's going to create a bundle, and it's going to push all the images to the registry. So the registry is a, me is a mechanism to, to uh, it's like a centralized repository, so my cluster can pull them from the registry. This is a way to ship the application from localhost via registry to anywhere. So that's I'm using a public rep repo for this. And now I'm going to, um, I'm going to go and deploy it actually that doesn't work <laughs> no I it works but I have to do another thing um, I have there's there's a bug right now in swarm that if you have two ser two ports per one service it's it's freaking out so I have to remove one port uh, there's one service here this one here it has two ports I have to remove it if I do that it's fine everything keeps working wonderfully <laughs> um, like this and that was Marcus helping me identify this. OK, so now I've removed the port. Did I forget anything? So uh, like ad hoc fixes, I had to edit it to remove the port, keep only port 80. Um, and then after I finish, I have to publish it. But that didn't work. So um, OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deploy it. So if I, I go back to my, my Uh, this is my uh, rolling update. Let's stop that uh, here. Mm. 
Docker services ls doc, uh, service, sorry. Yeah. Docker service rm city. I'm removing the service from the cluster. OK. Now I'm going to do Docker. I, I'm going to s change my directory to the example voting app where I have my, um, my example voting app. I have a backup in case I m made a mistake. Uh, s deploy example voting app. So this Docker client is talking to my cluster, and I'm, t I'm giving him the name. And he's automatically going to look for the distributed uh, application bundle file. So if I put dab, he's going to say, I can't find dab dab. So I have to remove that, just dab, just like this. So now he did uh, created, created a default network, created all of the services. If I do Docker service alas, I can see that they are all running. Um, let me just ELB to show the visualizer. Yeah, so the visualizer is showing me that I have the worker, I have the Postgres running, I have Redis. Obviously, Postgres is not being like, if, if this container dies, data is gone, right? This is not, not how you would deploy normally. Uh, Redis, so if you want to have Postgres persisted, you have to define a network attached volume, you have to mount the volume and all of that. That's, I'm not talking about that right now. Uh, so the server is there, the result is there. OK, so if I go docker inspect service um, example voting app uh, result, I think. No. Ah, it's uh, service inspect, sorry. So I'm not always copy pasting. Let me do it pretty. OK, so it tells me that this uh, is published on port uh, 30,001. Um, so normally, you should be able to do Docker service publish. And then what was the command? <laughs> it's uh, something like publish. Uh, sorry, it's update, and then publish the address like 30,001 and uh, point it to port 80 of the result. But uh, when I tried earlier, it didn't work. Um, so I, I need to figure out why. But in the meantime, uh, I'm just adding manually. So the thing is, when you do a distributed application building right now, it doesn't automatically open the listener in the ELB. And uh, it will, I hope, someday. But right now, I'm doing ELB create, and I'm adding listener for um, and the, the ports there are not right. So I should fix that. Let's do the first one. Actually, I can use my history. So this is the that one that's already there. Oops. And OK. So now if I go to, if I go to my uh, target DNS port 2001, so there is uh, no votes yet. It's running in the cloud. And if I hit the other one, if I click on cats, and if I go to the result, it's updated. So it worked. Yay. <laughs> OK. So that was everything. Uh, so basically, I went through um, using Docker for AWS to prepare a cluster. I went through uh, deploying an Nginx service. I went how it exposed. I went through uh, draining nodes, scaling the service, draining the nodes, putting them back af active. And then I went through creating a, converting a compose file to an applic uh, distributed application bundle, deploying it. And then there's a few rough edges. Uh, due to a bug, we cannot have multiple ports. And uh, the published one should work. I don't know why it didn't work. Uh, probably figure that out like five minutes after I finish. And, um, and that's about it. So any questions? <laughs> yeah? Uh, when you just say deploy the application bundle to a cluster, right? how does it map it? Do we specify somewhere? Let me give you the uh, context of the DAP file. So basically, the, the appli distributed application bundle, uh, I do less. All it contains is a, is a list of services. And every service has like the image it needs to run, which network it needs to compare, uh, connect to. So, um, so basically, your question is, like, how does it map these 
uh, like to the cluster or? The, the reason being is like because there could be a multiple clusters running on the same machine. Multiple, multiple clusters. clusters. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the way that works is I have um, I have my Docker host set and I have uh, I have a tunnel running from my local laptop to this particular. Uh, Docker for AWS ELB SSH. So this is the SSH port. So I'm 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 connecting to this master, and I am uh, forwarding the Docker engine control point to my local laptop. So I am actually telling my laptop to talk to this particular cluster, right? Uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, uh, in Kubernetes you have something called a Kubernetes control uh, configuration, and you can set the context. So you would set the context to one cluster or to another cluster. Uh, that's you can do with Kubernetes uh, that way. Actually, Kubernetes also has the concept of uh, uh, cluster federation, so they run uh, another layer across all clusters, and then you are able to, um, you know, schedule services across multiple clouds and things like that. But uh, I don't think uh, that's there yet with Docker 1.12. Uh, I think 1.12 is quite exciting. Um, the way, like, if you if you look at oh, there's one more thing maybe I wanted to say. Sorry. <laughs> um, so Docker for, for AWS is having this very complicated where you have like AWS specific uh, VPC, EC2, I, um, identity ma management, EBS, ELB. It's very specific. Uh, and then inside the Docker side of things, we have the uh, user application, uh, the storage plugin, and infrastructure management. So um, Docker. Announced back like in October four or something, they announced something called InfraKit, which is um, a way that they want to abstract the infrastructure. So, the, why I talk about this because it's it's kind of it's the start of this infrastructure management tool, but it's not there right right now. Docker for AWS, I do it's it's running the orchestration within the cluster. Uh, it's I don't think it's using InfraKit right now because InfraKit is very very much at the beginning stage. So uh, I just wanted to mention that because I don't know why I wanted to mention that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you were asking about clusters, and I thought ah no because I found it very exciting because the way that um, they actually like built. It's built on top of a lot of uh, experience, like, Cube like Google designed Kubernetes. They made it open source. Uh, and then Docker uh, had their own swarm solution, uh, which was running uh, in a very different way. And uh, they basically took a lot of the uh, lessons learned from the first version of Swarm that they had. And then they took a lot of the good aspects of uh, Kubernetes. And they combined it and, and in such a way that I think um, it's very promising. Uh, to be honest, Kubernetes right now it's being used in production by a big comp by, by a lot of companies. Uh, so Q Kubernetes is really mature. Uh, Docker uh, for AWS it's still in private beta, and Docker 1.12 is um, it's stable, it's stable, uh, <laughs> but um, it's not as advanced as uh, Kubernetes. I, I must say honestly, uh, but it's definitely going in, in a very interesting direction, right? So that was uh, a part of your. Question: uh, Anybody else? And now everybody's afraid. Like, oh my God, it's going to take so long to explain again. <laughs> um, volumes? Is that working? Like, uh, I have not played with the volumes, and you reminded me because we talked about logging, right? How do we get the application logs? So, one very exciting thing uh, with the latest release of this beta is um, they added container logs are automatically sent to CloudWatch. So what happens is. Um, when you run Docker for AWS, it actually runs a volume dri a logging driver in the background, and everything is automatically accessible on CloudWatch. Uh, if I find it here, so if I go into my CloudWatch log groups, I can see my Docker for AWS. I think there should be two now. Yes, because I have the second cluster. So if I click this one, I can see all my. It's a bit difficult to know which container it is, uh, but um, last time I was having an error with uh, my like. I was having an error with my, uh, for example, this this container, which is the vote server. So E A D, something like that. So if I take that, oh, my 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 uh, terminal broke. I did something. Um, okay. So if I put that here, yeah, there it is. So I can see all the logs of that container uh, directly in in in, the, in this uh, CloudWatch. So it's very very integrated. So I don't think ECS even has that like. Ability. I'm not sure. 
I don't, I don't know how the log shipping in ECS works from Amazon, but um, I find this very interesting. Ah, OK. Um, why did I talk about it? Ah, you, you asked me about <laughs> volumes. Yeah. But then I remember that I forgot to show about the logs. Because the volumes, I, I'm not sure how to handle the volumes yet. Is it supposed <coughs> to be handled dynamically? Is it supposed to be? I don't know. I really don't know because um, I, w I would assume this would be part of the distributed application bundle definition, right? Because when you do uh, Docker Compose, you specify the volumes. So the vol the, the, when you do Docker Compose bundle, you create a distributed application bundle in there. It should define the images. It should define the volumes. It should define the ports, everything. So I think when, we, when I, I ran the command, yeah, it that yeah not, not supported, support right? <laughs> so as I said, it's experimental. Uh, where is it? I was there. OK. Oh. Ah, yeah. My, my terminal is broken. Sorry. Yeah, so yeah, I was complaining about some things not yet supported. Like I said, it's, very, it's, it's still experimental, uh, the distributed application bundles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah? So how does this relate to ECS? Oh, so ECS is, um, is Amazon's own solution to run uh, containers. So ECS uh, spins up EC2 instances, runs an agent on them, and then they manage the, the managers. So what I did here, when I, uh, I did this, I spin this up. Where is my EC2? Here, right? If I go to my instances, I have my, and I'm probably going to have a big bill. <laughs> Uh, I have my, my Docker for AWS uh, managers running. So if you would be using ECS, you would only see the workers. The managers would be managed by, uh, by Amazon. So you don't need to worry about them. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and so the difference is, yes, you, you don't have to pay even. You only pay for the EC2 instances, like the workers, right, for ECS. You don't pay for the, so ECS may be cheaper, but it doesn't have, like, um, the same functionality, like, uh, I, 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 yeah. I don't know how many nodes you can scale ECS. I, I have no information here. Too bad Kai is not here. <laughs> Where is he when you need him, right? <laughs> So yeah, Kai is uh, very. Do, do managers actually work as workers as well? Oh yeah, as you saw in the visualizers, we actually saw that some of the managers here, like we have three managers, they're actually running workload. You can set this up. Yeah, you can say that this node should not run anything. Like uh, this is usually through n labels uh, that you do this. They take, like, the managers? Yeah. Um, I don't know because Docker Engine, I, it's like integrated. The swarm mode is integrated inside the Docker daemon, so it's a flag you enable. I don't know exactly how much more memory the engine uses uh, when it actually has this. Uh, but as you saw, it's also running some containers. And those containers are actually like integration with AWS, like for SQS notifications and things like that, and setting up the ELB and things like that. So, so on one side, we have the, the managers that are running in the daemon, which has no matter which cloud you're on, and then additional containers um, that manage. Yeah. Is Did it I? possible to deploy a using Docker? Yes. Yes. Do you want to do it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have no. I've not done it though. Persistent data. So if we are, this is a very big topic because, like, even for Kubernetes, um, it's very good at running stateless data and when you and it even has the support for vo persistence using volumes but still most people i know are running their databases outside of the cluster um, you you can have network network attached storage to provide the volumes you can either use ebs to mount the volume inside the instance and then whenever the container moves to a different instance the the orchestrator needs to put it to the different instance where the container moves. There's many solutions for that. So it's, I mean, it's a very big topic. Uh, it's what everybody is, is want to work on. It's how to manage, manage persistence. Uh, but uh, for now, uh, most people are still running a database outside. Uh, we are running Elasticsearch with, with shards on a cluster, on a Kubernetes cluster. We do not have uh, volumes set up. We don't have a persistence set up. But if a node dies, or if, if containers die, the replication of Elasticsearch automatically re-replicates. So it, 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 it has its persistence uh, as it runs in the cluster. Uh, 
But if the head dies, then Elasticsearch dies. <laughs> anyway. Is there a way to have a, a node affinity of services where, for example, you have a service and a database on the, on the same? Uh, ah, so like same. in Kubernetes? Uh, no, not really like in Kubernetes. But um, like you want to co-locate certain yeah. services. Yeah. So I would imagine that you would do that in the task definition. Uh, so that I, I'm, I'm not sure actually, but I think you can. I'm not sure if you can have multiple containers per task. So the way it works, like when I do a Docker create service, it creates a service, and then it, the the tasks are the actual uh, things running uh, the the uh, implementing the service or serving the service. So the tasks are could be a container, could be a VM, could be anything. So they didn't call it containers; they call it tasks. Uh, in in Kubernetes, they call it pods. Um, so for co-location, maybe tasks are the solution. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but if you want to know more, like uh, Google has a very uh, detailed explanation of why they use the pod concepts, how you co-locate, and what are the advantages of that. Yeah. I'm not even sure it would be optimized. I'm sure that by default they would go out and go in again. I think mm -hmm. that they would. For what? For tasks? No, no. If you put, if you co-locate them in the same server, I'm sure that they. Anyway, in Swarm there? I'm not sure. But in Kubernetes, they definitely communicate over local host. They, they talk locally, and they share volumes and things like that. In Kubernetes, you can have two different containers with their own file system. They can be one Ubuntu, can be one Alpine, uh, but they can share a volume, and they can communicate over local hosts. So you can co-locate services. Um, that's a very strong concept uh, that is in, in a lot of orchestrators. They add this concept. Yeah. Red Hat solution, OpenShift. Open origin is there. So yes. Yeah. It's a commercially built product on top of Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Yes. So, so you can try it out. Yeah, there's. Open, is open source. It just, it's yeah. available in. Red Hat Red promised me access, but they never gave me. <laughs> what are the concepts which you have seen now? It's all implemented out of box. Yeah, it's on top of Kubernetes. It's all implemented in Kubernetes. Persistent volume, they have a concept like you can assign a persistent volume on the local host and you can just use it for database. So so on top of Kubernetes, you have OpenShift, you have um, you have Fabric 8. They have their own solution. I don't know exactly what's it called. Um, then they have uh, Tectonic, a lot of hosted solutions. Uh, even DigitalOcean is like implementing Kubernetes in their cluster, in their uh, as a service, um, like on, on top of DigitalOcean. So Kubernetes, uh, like I said, is used in production, and a lot of companies like Red Hat they they build on top of it. And Red Hat also contributed a lot to the actual Kubernetes source code. Um, there's a there's a lot of orchestrators. Uh, so Docker here is has their own orchestrator. It's not as mature, but I I think it's going in a very interesting direction. Anybody else? No. Everybody's tired of hearing me. <laughs> All right. Then thank you.